So let's talk about rings. Uh, a lot of, rings are very popular, and so pendants are. Girls have ten fingers, two ears, and one neck. So what are they going to buy the most of? Uh, they're going to buy rings. <laughs> they got ten fingers to fill. They're going to. They might wear a pendant. They might put a bracelet on their two wrists, or they might buy earrings for two ears. Ten fingers. They're going to buy rings. Rings are very popular. So let's talk about how to design a ring the first time right. Because a lot of people will send me, once again, they'll send me a, a, a master and they'll want me to reproduce it uh, saying, well, I sent you a size seven and when I got it back, it was six and a quarter. <laughs> well, so let's talk about how, what went on. Uh, here's a, so here's a master ring. Here's a master. Uh, it is... Uh, size right now the master was a nine and a quarter okay so let's so I made a mold so let's figure this out I actually made a mold of this turtle and I shot a wax and now it is a, a nine so I lost a quarter size in the mold process and then I have a casted uh, unpolished piece and it is, let's just say that's around eight and uh, three quarters, eight and a half, eight and five eighths. Right, or, well, okay, if I was to hammer this, let's just say it's eight and three quarters. So I got up here, ring shrinkage. You're gonna lose a quarter of a ring size in a wax. You're going to lose a quarter in the cast, which is about a half a size. So you're losing a half a size, uh, but if you send me a wax, original and it goes through a casting process and so it's going to lose a quarter size so if you're sending me a wax original you're going to want you're going to lose three quarters of a ring size so if you want it to finish out as a size seven you need to send me a seven and three quarters okay so that's a wise tip <laughs> okay let's talk about designing for longevity uh things that are going to last um Quality control issues. <laughs> All right, so we have up number one is we have the turtle cuff bracelet. Okay, this is very thick. This actually went to uh, two different casters before it made it to me, uh, who couldn't do it, and it ended up at my shop. And I, I actually got this to work, and I do make these. Uh, but look at how. Now remember that cuffs are going to be opened and closed around your wrist. And so we want to make sure that there's no weak spots when you have something like this, uh, that all of these swirls are actually, you know, not weak in one spot. That you've got things holding this thing together. Um, because this piece has actually been designed a couple of times because it had weak spots in it. So, and you know, but people open and break it and then it would just break. Uh, you know, like right across where all these swirls were in a line. So you want to make sure that that doesn't happen. So think about, you know, if, it, if it, is it going to last. Another thing I want to talk about is uh, complex designs. Uh, designs to save weight. Weight is everything. <laughs> so, uh, especially when you got gold at $22.53 an ounce. So here is my conch shell piece. And so, so conch shell design is actually 3D, a front and the back. So, this would be very, very solid. If this was solid in, the, in this whole area, it was solid, that might add an, an additional five grams to the piece, which is, you know, in gold, an extra five grams could be $150 or something like that. So, we want to get this out. So, what I ended up doing on this design was I made two molds. I made two masters, and then I assembled it after the fact. What I have first is I have the main body of the piece. Uh, and the top has been taken off. So there's no top here. And that way I can get a hole through here and I can hollow this out and get that done. And then I have the top of the piece, which gets soldered on here like that after it's been casted. Well, technically I do it in the wax. But this way I can get my mold in here and I save myself about five grams. So let's talk about, you know, what this would have cost had I have not have done that. This, uh, this piece is actually in 14 karat gold right now. So let's see, how much is this thing worth? Uh, 
Uh, in gold, I weighed this just now. It's uh, thirteen point two grams in fourteen karat white gold. Uh, at the price of twenty two fifty three for today, uh, times the twenty two fifty three equals two hundred ninety seven dollars and forty cents in fourteen karat gold right now, just in the gold alone. So if it had an additional five grams, let's say in there, uh, you know, we could be looking at an, an additional hundred hundred and thirty dollars in there which would have put us you know three hundred and thirty four hundred bucks so we could have been over four hundred dollars in gold on this piece uh, so we saved some money here uh, if we were to do this piece in silver just in a comparison uh, in silver uh, silver actually weighs less than gold it is lighter so in silver it would have been 10.2 grams at 51 cents a gram today uh, is five dollars and twenty cents. So in silver, I can produce this for about five dollars and twenty cents, uh, which is nice. So let's talk about uh, a little bit next is uh, be making the grinder and the caster your friend, and making a piece that is actually producible mass production wise. Uh, let's take a look at a couple examples of things that. Here's a turtle, and you can see it actually has a hammered effect to it. So somebody had, in the design, people love to do this uh, for handmade items, take a hammer with a rubber, with a round ball on the end, and just smack it, and give it that texture, a nice little texture, it, you know, it's better than a flat piece, that's for sure. So people do this, so the fact, now when you cast this piece, uh, silver actually reacts to the plaster mix, the investment, as it's called, and will leave porosity and little grains, and things that have to be grinded out. So when I go to polish this piece, I will need to grind past that porosity, therefore I will actually take out a lot of this hammered effect. Uh, so you may, if your design calls for it, you may want to wait until after it is casted and shipped and you do it one at a time with the hammer. That's always fun, right? <laughs> so, so it's up to you, I do this one, it's in the mold, and then I, I spend that extra time to finish it. You can, uh, a lot of people also do the bracelets. You see, I mean, this is a bracelet with, uh, no, it's just a high polish. So, you know, a lot of people like to take the hammer and put that in and, and give it that little uh, silversmith look to it. So, yeah, um, the fact is, do you want to do it before or after the manufacturing is done? It is completely up to you. It just depends on, if you're going to put the hammered effect in there, make sure it's deep and that it will survive through the grinding and polishing and that kind of a effect. Okay, another thing that people do is, uh, here is a charity piece for the veterans. Uh, it's a rifle with a helmet. Um, this one has actually been diamond cut with sort of a, an engraver effect and dug grooves into it using a diamond blade, uh, giving it that little sparkle, <laughs> kind of like Christmas time. And uh, that's a really fun effect, and a lot of silversmiths uh, use that. The fact is, is when do you put it in? This one has been diamond cut and then was sent to me to make a mold and produce, so it doesn't have the shiny effect to it. And so they call me and they're like, well, we want to, we want you to re-diamond cut it, you know, so it's glossy. So in a lot of these cases, for diamond cutting, I highly recommend that the piece be left uh, original and then do the diamond cutting after. Um, so you get that high gloss because trying to re go over something that's already been done is a lot more complicated than just doing it fresh out of the cast. Let's also talk about making the polisher your friend <laughs> because uh, you know how long is it going to take to finish this thing? Uh, how long does it take to polish? Some people, some some pieces are designed for very easy polishing, get it done in less than five minutes, and some people are gallery pieces where they, they it's okay because they want because they're going to try to sell it for several hundred dollars and so it's, it's okay if, if they spend you know 30 minutes to an hour polishing it. So let's look at some things that are really hard to polish that I just have laying in the shop uh, that I can show you. Um, here is a starfish ring. Gallery worthy for sure. Um, it has these little bubbles on it as you can see. Now, to polish a little bubble, is, is you're going to need some very, very fine polishing tools, such as brushes, a lot, like this one that you can put on your polishing wheel, little brushes like this, and, you know, the big 
brush like that to get in between all of these little little bubbles drops of wax and you know design that you have put in there and this piece will probably take you over an hour to polish and it does uh, you you may even have to come to your bench and and use your Dremel tools here with little brushes like this uh, little texture tools uh, little tools little brush little brushes like that and get in there with brushes so it will be a pain uh, your polisher uh, just, it's going to be hard. So think about who's going to polish it. It's going to be me. It's going to be you. So, <laughs> uh, other pieces. Uh, here's a ring that has not been polished. It's got all of this filigree work into it. Um, you know, that all of that stuff inside each and every one of that has to be polished. Who's going to do that? How much are you willing to spend to do it? Uh, is it is it better to leave it filigree? Absolutely, because now it's lighter. It's going to weigh less. But it's going to be a polishing nightmare <laughs> for somebody. Whether it be me or whether it be you, somebody's going to have to clean up all of those inside all of these channels and of the design. So I think that's everything that I wanted to talk about, about designing in your head to make sure that you're thinking ahead because new designers aren't really thinking about all that kind of stuff. My next video, I will be doing some tutorials on actually making some pieces. This is my, my daily blog. And then uh, my first tutorial, I'm actually, I'm pretty excited. I love this. I actually love doing lapidary. And I am going to, I picked this seashell up not long ago. Um, and we're going to take this, we're going to cut it up, and we're going to make some jewelry out of it for free. Uh, so I helped. I hope that uh, helps you out a little bit with the uh, sizes, weights, and minimum uh, weights and things like that. And tomorrow we're going to, uh, I'm going to go through, I'm going to break out all my tools. Okay, I have about $300,000 worth of tools. I'm going to show you which tools, and I've, I'm going to show you, okay, let's, let's talk. All right, so here's the Rio Grande catalog, and that's where I get a lot of my stuff. You can use Stoller and Hoover and Strong or whatever you want. Uh, I basically uh, have purchased almost everything in this magazine, uh, in this catalog. Just tools, 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 tools. And I pretty much have everything in this book. So, or have purchased it and have tested it or whatever. So I'm going to give you some tips on which starter tools tomorrow. Tomorrow we're going to talk about starter tools, uh, which is wax carving and how to get in as a designer. And I, I will do a video later about how to be a silversmith. But tomorrow we're going to talk about as a designer, as a wax carver, and we're going to go through some basic tools that I like to use. Okay, thanks for joining me for Bench Talk uh, with Jonathan Artsy Silver. Okay.